Welcome to X Talks. My name is Molly Ruggles and I'm with Residential Education at Open Learning. It's great to see you all. This afternoon, we're, we're thrilled to host Sanjay Sarma and Luke Yokinto, who will be talking about their new book, Grasp, The Science of Transforming How We Learn. Uh, just a little bit of information about the presenters. Um, among a host of accomplishments and impactful contributions to education, science, and technology, Sanjay Sarma is most well known to us MIT folks as the VP of Open Learning. He's also a professor of mechanical engineering. Luke Yokinto is a science writer and he's currently doing research with the MIT Age Lab. So at this point, I'll turn things over to you, Sanjay. I'm looking forward to learning more about the book from you and Luke. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Molly. And hello everyone from, uh, I see from different parts of the world actually. Um, it's a nice, it's a beautiful fall day here in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts. And in um, uh, recognition of that, I have my fall uh, uniform on, which actually was also the uniform I used to wear uh, when I used to work in the oil industry, which I'll talk about briefly. That's the rig I used to work on. It used to be called the Maersk Vinlander out in the North Sea. So um, uh, let me just kick things off and then Luke will actually uh, uh, do the bulk of the, um, of the description of the book, but I want to give you a high level description and then I'll come back and close it. So um, the MIT Integrated Learn, uh, at the Massachusetts, the, sorry, the Open Learning Office at MIT um, has an office, has a lab at a research effort called the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative. We were set up initially to share knowledge uh, with the world. It started with OpenCourseWare, MITx, the MicroMasters, um, and a number of other programs you started over the years. I'll talk about the MicroMasters particularly later. And that now reports into Professor uh, Krishna Rajagopal. And there's an extraordinary team doing all the MITx course development. And the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative was set up because we realized very quickly that if we were going to produce content for the world, we had to base it on some science of learning. Surely we would, uh, if as an M, this being MIT, we would need to understand how the brain remembers, how it forgets, uh, uh, what are the mechanisms of a memory, what is the optimal length of a video, and we didn't have the answers to many of these questions. So um, I started reading about cognitive uh, neuroscience and cognitive science, and I discovered this incredible colleague at MIT, um, John Gabrielli, and we set up mightily. And in the in the um, journey of figuring out how to uh, develop a playbook for open learning, how to produce content, whether it's video or text, how to do assessments, the difference between formative assessments and summative assessments, uh, how to space them out, uh, whether you should interleave them, you know, all these questions. Um, uh, we, I started writing a document. Uh, we wrote a document uh, called uh, the, um, uh, for, as a part of an effort that MIT initiated that I co-chaired with Professor Karen Wilcox called the Online uh, Education Policy Initiative. It was funded by the Carnegie Corporation, and it's still available, that document, actually, at uh, oepi.mit.edu. And um, we started work, we, this, this document captured our findings about the science of learning. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist by any means or a cognitive scientist by any means. I'm someone who came from the outside. I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, but I have been an educator for 25 years, and I've been, you know, in education for the majority of my life. And um, I began to see all sorts of resonances with my own uh, personal story and, frankly, my own personal struggles. Um, we also found resonance. I also found resonances with um, some historical ills of society, some issues with regards to scientific racism, um, you know, questions of... Uh, of, um, for example, IQ, you know, IQ became a weapon in the hands of folks who were trying to uh, take entire peoples and uh, put them in, in buckets. So um, it, it, this issue that we got into of uh, the science of learning became much deeper than merely um, one of understanding memory, which is an important thing. In, in it, we found um, all sorts of hidden stories of people, people like Thorndike and Dewey and so on. So um, this book really began with that report. And then in um, um, about the 2015, 2014, 15 timeframe, um, I started to think about a book and um, I um, needed, I really needed some help writing it, someone very talented who could help me craft this narrative, uh, but also continue to do some of the thinking and research and uh, perhaps continue to do interviews 
uh, with some of the key people. So initially, I started working with someone by the name of um, Bill Rosen, um, a very talented man. And tragically, he passed away as we were formulating the book. Um, it was heartbreaking. Um, and then uh, I sort of uh, retracted a little bit. And then um, uh, we, I had the good fortune to meet uh, Luke Quinto, who became my co-author. And Luke has been just an extraordinary partner in crafting what is really a composition of four narratives, four arcs, four narrative arcs. And so Luke will talk about um, some of the details in the book, but let me tell you those four arcs before I hand off to him. The first arc is my own personal story. I went to the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in India, I had a wonderful time there. I met my wife there. Um, it turns out that it's a very difficult uh, college to get into those competitive exam and the people who get in you know, sort of uh, the chosen ones. We went there uh, and I completely lost my way, frankly. And um, um, Frank, what happened there was that I was surrounded by really brilliant people. The professors were great, but I could not get myself going. I mean, I graduated, um, but I learned um, some, but I discovered later that what had happened to me, what had happened to me is I lost my curiosity. Um, when I finished um, working at, uh, uh, finished my degree at IIT Kanpur, I went uh, to work in an oil rig in the North Sea. And I went through a training program for this company called Schlumberger, sort of a boot camp in learning how to operate complex oil, refine oil, uh, uh, the, you know, we produce the first oil. So separate technology for producing the first oil, separating separators, uh, burning it off um, on these uh, rigs. These are floating rigs in the British sector of the North Sea. Uh, we'd go in on helicopters, do the work there, but we had to get trained for it. And suddenly in that training, I was reawoken. I discovered curiosity, I discovered purpose, I discovered context. And what, I, what our research in learning showed us uh, was, uh, it sort of resonated with that story. So that's the first arc. The second arc that um, uh, we will talk about, uh, that we do talk about in the book is the arc of, um, of uh, uh, neuroscience and cognitive science. It actually starts in, um, in Madrid with someone who won the Nobel Prize eventually, uh, uh, Santiago, um, um, I Cajal, and um, Cajal uh, is the man who um, was, a, uh, was a Santiago Ramon I Cajal. Uh, in fact, there's a thoroughfare named in Madrid after him, named, uh, named after him in Madrid. Um, and he's the person who first and very presciently described how neurons look and drew the first pictures, took images with stains, and then in some ways sort of set neuroscience on its pathway. And that field developed sort of independently, starting from neurons, and uh, especially in the last 20 years, there's been some amazing breakthroughs in that. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, uh, we do talk about it in the book, and, and um, um, uh, Luke will talk a little bit more about it. The third arc is a course at MIT called 2007. And what 2007 is, is it's the progenitor of all the robotics contests that you see around the world. Um, it was founded by someone called Woody Flowers, a, a dear friend and a mentor, a mentor to the Office of Open Learning, who passed away tragically last year, just heartbreaking. Um, all of a sudden, really um, um, meant a lot to many of us and inspired a, a whole cohort of faculty members and, and students. And 2007 is one of those courses where you learn with a kit of things and you have to build robots that compete with each other or perform a task. And every year it's a different task. Um, and that course embodies so much about learning that we lose in many of our traditional classes. It has to do with constructivism, which is in constructing, you build a holistic model of what you're trying to learn. Um, and um, it is, in some ways, it runs afoul of a very different approach to learning, which is, well, let me train you in a behavioral way and let me sort of get you to have certain instincts which is very sort of almost um, rudimentary and reductionist, which is the fourth arc. And that is the story of um, the battle between Dewey and Thorndike, two epic uh, researchers um, in the at the turn of the uh, 19th century into the 20th century. And uh, Dewey had a very beautiful outside in view of the world. And Thorndike had an inside out view of the world, which is he tried to go to the neuroscience and the cognitive science. The problem is that the neuroscience and the cognitive science they had was not what we know today. It was a little bit sort of they stopped short and they were a little bit uh, biased by their own implicit uh, assumptions about society and race and so on. So that, that approach, the reductive approach ended up a blind alley. And unfortunately, to this day, 
drives the way we do education. And it has to do with IQ and, you know, and treating um, students a little bit like automatons rather than developing them so that they can be full human beings. Um, and what they did in the reductive approach and reductionist approach is they ignored the emergent genius magic of the human mind, which Dewey and Woody Flowers and others captured. Today, we could make the same mistake, but in fact, cognitive science and neuroscience is now armed with a certain humility, but also with a lot more tools. And so we believe that the time is now right for the inside out and the outside in approaches to be looked at uh, together. Uh, with the, again, with that humility of recognizing that the incredibly emergent properties of the brain are something we can never, ever uh, underplay. So with that, I'll hand off to Luke. Uh, Luke, tell us the story, man. All right. Hey, thank you, Sanjay. That was fantastic. And, you know, I really want to just say it's been such a pleasure and, and honor <clears throat> to work on this um, with you and to, and to be able to speak to all the people at MIT and beyond that I've had the uh, pleasure of speaking to. Also, a quick shout out to Joe Coughlin and the team at the MIT Age Lab, which is where my day job is. They've really given me an extremely long leech to uh, to work on this project, and I really, really appreciate it. So, uh, you know, I, what, another thing I appreciate is um, just the number of experts in their field, especially within co the cognitive sciences, who have just taken me aside and, and answered my dumb questions. And um, it turns out that there are a lot of strategies from within the con cognitive sciences that uh, that are possibly applicable to educational practice at this point. And the question that Sanjay raised is, how do, you, how do you do that with humility? How do you do that without causing new problems for learners? Um, and uh, it's a complicated question. So I'll, I'll dive into it with a little slideshow that I put together. And uh, hopefully that will work. I think it is working. Okay, um, so. Uh, this is this is a map of the North Sea uh, because I knew Sanjay was going to be talking about the little, little time he spent there. Um, and what I like to do f for a metaphor is just imagine educating a student is not a metaphorical journey, but a literal journey. You need to get from point A to point B. You know, point A is in Norway, point B is in, in Aberdeen, Scotland. There we go. Uh, and you need to get them in there safely. How can you how can you do that? Well, there's two. Uh, approaches you could take. You could take a reductivist, um, reductionist, uh, mechanistic approach where you say, uh, here's what we know about geologic, you know, coastal geology, here's what we know about currents and winds, therefore this route is the right route and it's going to be the safest and most efficient route. Or you could take an outside in more holistic approach and say, well, hang on, uh, mechanistic people, uh, you know, your models can't uh, incorporate everything that's possibly out there. Maybe there are rogue waves, maybe there are sea monsters. So Actually, probably the best route is to see what real ships in the real world have done and not to, not to try to break it down to something smaller than that. So we'll, if you look at, look at this map, you know, it looks like we're going to stick through the coast rather than taking the shortcut, right? And um, you know, when it comes to education, uh, both, both views of the world are, are powerful and it's easy to see how either could go off the rails. Inside out thinking is an extremely powerful explanatory tactic but it's easy to be reductive. It's easy to miss that rogue wave. It's easy to miss that uh, just a key part of the picture if you don't know that it's it's um, uh, incorporated. And outside in approach, um, you can be misled in other ways. You can have a kind of a lemming effect where you en end up following people who have come before you. And it can be tough to test those theories and models unless you turn to reductive uh, reductionist methods. Um, so those two, pro those two approaches kind of personified in education, uh, E.L. Thorndike, and John Dewey. Um, so they had, a lot, they had a lot in common. They're both psychologists at the dawn of the modern field. Um, when This was a time when basically any psychologist would know any other psychologist in the US, um, but you know, personally or by, or by reputation. Um, They're both devotees of William James. They were colleagues even at Co uh, Columbia Teachers College, but their impulses were fundamentally different. And uh, just for fun, I, I picked this picture because their uh, mustaches are so different. Uh, E.L. Thorndike, Looks like he uh, sculpted his with the aid of a protractor, and Dewey's is much bushier. And that basically uh, uh, corresponds to their philosophies of science, believe it or not. So uh, Thorndike was a consummate reductionist. Um, to him, a human, human being was too large and uh, an object to study, so he had to find ways to pick apart mechanisms of human thought. Dewey was the opposite. 
to him an individual human being was too small to study. So he built an entire laboratory school to have an object big enough to study. So he had a very holistic approach. And they had um, correspondingly different beliefs about learning. To Thorndike, learning was a matter of efficiently making associations. Uh, he argued that when people, or in the case of his original experimental subjects, hungry cats, do something that results in a desirable outcome, they become increasingly likely to repeat that action. And so they form associations. And those theories came with certain other uh, attendant assumptions as well about students. He believed, uh, like many of his contemporaries, I'll, I'll add, that um, the ability to form useful associations was both, both uh, genetically determined and set for life. And to him, that meant school should function less like a nursery and more like a winnower uh, separating wheat from the chaff. As he, as he told his, uh, his education students at Columbia University, the one thing that schools or any other educational forces can do least was to develop powers and capacities. So to Thorndike's mind, intelligence was not improvable and uh, therefore schools should focus on separating students. Um, Dewey, meanwhile, saw learning as constant experimentation. Um, he, he likened the, uh, the quote unquote, uh, native and unspoiled attitude of childhood to, uh, he said it was near, very near to the attitude of the scientific mind. Uh, to him, context was essential. He didn't want to divide school into subjects like mathematics, geography, and science. It was very project-based. And there was an important social aspect as well. He had uh, even had students act uh, as like different members of society in the little society that they put together. Um, it was really interesting. Um, and in terms of their legacy, uh, one of these famous quotes uh, in education history is that, um, I'm gonna paraphrase, uh, it's, it's from Ellen Condliffe uh, Lagerman. It's that um, uh, to, to, at the risk of, of being uh, absurdly broad, um, the history of, of 20th century education is something along the lines of uh, Thorndike won and Dewey lost. And um, you know, that's not to say that Dewey was forgotten, not by any means, he's became, become sort of an ed school aspiration. He's, like, he's become something that schools strive to achieve his philosophy while still checking every one of the boxes set up by Thorndike and his allies. Thorndike, meanwhile, um, by chopping up learning into manageable, measurable, countable chunks, Thorndike's theory uh, created a scientific rationale for what would become a decades-long nationwide, ultimately international, push for standardization of school. So we're talking curricula, tests, schedules, GPAs, you name it. Um, this is when you started to hear about the college track in high schools as opposed to the vocational track. Uh, it was an ethos that fit in extremely well with the vogue for Taylorism or scientific management, which was then sweep, sweeping private sector and the government. Um, you know, most importantly, this was a research thread that both informed the decisions of uh, education reformers who were just heck bent on uh, standardizing school and you know, just, as, just as frequently it provided them with uh, scientific justification for what they were doing after the fact. And um, finally, I'd be, I'd be remiss not to mention the scientific racism involved. You know, uh, neither reductionism nor um, holism are intrinsically racist, but you know, in educational psychology in the 19 teens, 20s and 30s, uh, reductionist approaches were effectively oh, almost always racist. I mean, Thorndike in particular, he was a devotee of Francis Galton who coined the term eugenics. He would belong to the pro-eugenics Galton Society in New York. And he, he did things like he advocated for vocational courses for, for students of color, which took them out of the academic track, made them ineligible for college, stuff, you know, stuff like that. It was really kind of disturbing stuff, actually. And uh, just, just to take a step back, just when we're talking about just the broader um, standardization that Thorndike um, kind of justified, Thorndike's um, philosophy of, of learning, we're still dealing with the uh, consequences today, uh, especially the idea that students' aptitude is readily knowable starting at a young age. And um, one consequence of that that became abundantly clear as Sanjay and I continued thinking about this stuff is that uh, the tactics schools rely on for their student sorting function, which is still with us today, those tactics often get in the way of their teaching and learning function. And uh, we now know that comes from, uh, we know more about uh, the reason why, and that comes from advances in the reductionist tradition of cognitive science, which in no way stayed frozen in place with, uh, with Thorndike. So this, I, I love this, um, I love this cartoon. It's, it's just fun to look at for a second. Some of you may have seen it. It's from uh, XKCD. Um, it's, uh, it's this idea of reductionism that uh, oh, sociology reduces to psychology and psychology reduces to biology and so forth. 
and the physicists think that they're they're the best, but of course the mathematicians are way way over there. Um, and uh, it's it's useful for thinking about how we think about uh, cognitive science uh, post Thorndike. To, to Thorndike, it was sort of a single level mechanism. The human the human brain was a black box with some sort of associationist learning processes in the middle. Um, but over the years, that box has gained levels. And so here's another diagram that I absolutely love. This diagram contains literally everything. You've got you've got neutron stars up here. You've got biology down here. You've uh, you know atoms down here, organic molecules, individual thought and language. I, this just just the the guts to to put together a, a diagram like that is just I think it's awesome. I I love it. Um, so there's a there's a whole um, sort of uh, subfield of, in the philosophy of science that's devoted to this this type of thought. You know, uh, are there levels of science? Are there, or or are there not? It's kind of contentious actually. And so you can think about le levels in terms of mechanism. Uh, so does does chemistry uh, emerge uh, from physics? Or you can think of it in terms of uh, phenomenology. So do we just separate chemistry from from, from physics because for whatever reason, our tools and methods um, just kind of lead us to, to, to think about them differently. Uh, you can also think about them just in terms of scale. You know, uh, chemistry is bigger than subatomic sub physics and um, molecular biology is bigger than chemistry and so forth. Um, so in the cognitive sciences, um, we can, at least for, our, for Sanjay and my purposes, we can, we can set aside the, uh, the uh, more Jesuitical uh, aspects of, the, of these debates. Um, uh, for, for our purposes, there, there are discrete levels. And in fact, you know, when you, I, I had the pleasure of talking to quite a few cognitive scientists at, at MIT and elsewhere, and often they would say, you know, you need, to, you need to talk to somebody at this level or that level, working at that level. And um, so the analogy I like to think, I like to use is that the cognitive sciences are kind of like a skyscraper with some levels really well illuminated and we know a lot. And then there's these um, layers of darkness in between them. And part of the work of, of it is to, is to connect to the uh, dark levels. And so this is kind of what the ground floor looks like. And this is what Thorndike thought all of learning looked like. Um, in a, in a, so this is uh, Aplesia Californica. And uh, Eric Kandel, who's a Nobel laureate, who I had the pleasure of speaking to for this book, was the first to isolate learning down to levels, down to the level of individual synapses. Um, and he, used, he used this animal model. And this is, um, it followed a pretty simple associationist learning pattern, very similar to what Thorndike put forward. And uh, you know, indeed, we you know, we believe that these fundamental principles of learning apply in humans too. But it turns out to be just the basement of a huge skyscraper. So we're so that is somewhere in here with the molecular level uh, underlying it. Um, and so, so now there, there are all these all these disciplines and all these and all these levels. And um, importantly, you know, from an educational perspective, here's the thing: when something goes wrong or gets disrupted at any of these levels, it has the potential to stop learning in its tracks. So you might reasonably ask how activity at the cellular level would affect, like how you would actually conduct a classroom. Um, and but. There really is a, there really is a, a factor there. Uh, so there's the spacing effect, which Sanjay Sanjay alluded to. Um, you know, you you've probably heard the expression "don't cram for an exam." Um, you know, that applies not just to us. So you you would space out your study your your study sessions. It applies not to us, but but to animals, basically across the board. It, it's it's conserved absurdly wi widely in animals. It, it, it's present in Aplesia, that that sea slug I showed you, and C. elegans, the roundworm. Um, uh, it, and when you have something conserved that widely, it's likely fundamental uh, to learning. And um, that's just, and so, so when you, so I'll get back to that. Um, yeah, at the brain systems level, a level up, that's the scale where structures in the brain would be visible to the human eye if they were outside of your head. We encounter things like curiosity as a drive, drive state analogous to hunger or thirst. Um, the perceptual circuits involved in reading and dyslexia, working memory limitations. Above that, cognitive psychology, you know, we talk about causal learning, um, how we integrate new information into our model of the world, um, storage and retrieval strength of memories, uh, metacognition, which is how we think about how well we know something, um, forgetting an effortful retrieval, which is, that's like a process that can strip away the cobwebs of a, of a sort of confused memory. Um, 
and, and, and so on. It, it, it keeps going up and, and the scope of, of your microscope keeps getting wider and wider and wider. And um, what sort of stopped us in our tracks as we assembled this picture, this multi-level picture, was the number of uh, educational in institutional structures kind of assembled from Thorndike's day that are, among other things, built to identify promising students or, or set up the winnowing function of school. And a, a number of these create stumbling blocks um, in terms of the, like the crucial learning processes that go on at all of these levels in, in this cognitive uh, skyscraper. So in terms of the spacing effect that I, that I mentioned, which shows up you know, both at the, um, the synapse level and also the cognitive psych level, um, you know, we, to this day, we, we have uh, semesters that end in high stakes final exams that, that reward cramming. And, you know, I, I personally have done quite a bit of it. And I can tell you that in college, I got an A minus in calculus. I can also tell you that I cannot remember a lick of it. And that's bad. You know, we, we rightly invest a lot of society's wealth and energy into teaching and learning. And I, I just want to say that it's bad that stuff like that, that we invest, that we invest in uh, teaching gets forgotten by so many of us. And so spacing and revisiting things, if we had a different temporal stru structure somehow, uh, would help prevent that wastage from happening. You know, another one, we talk about working memory at, at um, sort of the brain systems or, or even cognitive psych level. Uh, stereotype threat is something where uh, if you're from a disadvantaged group and that is um, you know, by, by unfair reputation not supposed to do well on a test, that can eat into your working memory and at the margins that can really hurt you. Um, so, uh, and, high, and high stakes testing can be, can be harmful in that way. Um, you know, more, more broadly, the Thorndikean project of standardizing school introduces problems with motivation and curiosity. For some students, maybe GPA just isn't a motivator. And uh, the way we structure school almost kind of takes it for granted that, that students would be motivated by grades. Um, you know, Dewey believed that you should be motivated by uh, uh, the here and now. And a grade motivation is tantamount to being motivated for a future reward. It's just a, it's, it's a different way of thinking about it. So all this taken together raises some serious questions. Um, is school as we know it putting a thumb on the scale of how society determines which students are considered promising? Does introducing co cognitive stumbling blocks across the board disproportionately harm disadvantaged students, maybe uh, who are experiencing external stressors? Uh, perhaps most importantly, is the relative handful of students who make it into selective programs and academic uh, futures, is, is that group, actually an incredibly small subset of people who might thrive academically if we did things differently. Um, and you know, it, I, I won't get into it now for time constraints, but like we believe that there are a lot of people who would really benefit if we, uh, if we address these issues. Um, and finally, you know, this cognitive sky, sky, skyscraper is, there's a lot of it is still dark. And what that means is there could be other examples of show-stopping issues in the cognitive skyscraper, if you will, that we don't even know about yet, that as we discover them, we're gonna to wanna to deal with, you know, sort of like dyslexia was once a mystery and now we're, we're, we're finding out more and more and more about it. And uh, perhaps there are other mysterious things like that in there that we, can, that we can find and we can, and in the meantime, we can mitigate the issues that we know about now. So the big question and the question that we have to deal with, that we've dealt with in, in our book is, uh, do we now know enough to pull the trigger and attempt to apply uh, reductionist mechanistic findings from this cognitive skyscraper to educational practice? And it's a, it's a tricky question. You know, the, the entire project of, uh, of reductivist um, cognitive science is Thorndikean in a sense. And we, we faced the same leap of faith that he faced. We, when he, when he tried to put this, his findings into practice and, and his allies did, it was the best um, scientific knowledge available at the time. And likewise, that's all we have now is the best scientific knowledge available. Um, uh, it's, it's a, you know, pulling the trigger and putting this to work is a, is a leap, leap of faith. And so one thing that um, Sanjay and I found powerful is to say, you know what? We don't have to limit ourselves to this um, reductivist um, tradition. We can turn to the Dewey style outside in tradition for guidance. And when you think back to the two maps, we can see where the two maps line up and see where um, both traditions um, have, a, have a strong indication of, uh, 
of uh, powerful approaches that wouldn't that wouldn't harm people would only help them. And so I, I'll now hand you all back to Sanjay because I think he was going to talk a little bit more about uh, one particularly hands-on, do we approve the approach that we explore in depth in, uh, in GRASP, which is uh, course 2007. Thank you, Luke. So 2007 is, as I said, this course where uh, students are given a kit and then they participate in a competition. It can be cooperative, it can be competitive, you know, it might be a thing where they build robots where uh, each student has a robot and has to go accumulate points by getting balls and putting them in baskets and so on. And it's a very, cons and I've taught this course. Um, and um, so the question is, should you teach design bottom up where you teach the mechanics and so on of, you know, how when things break, yield strength, uh, kinematics, et cetera, or should you teach design this other way where you have a systems problem and you're addressing it outside in? And MIT is pretty unique in that we do both. Now in this course where we teach, and by the way, when I learned in India at IIT, which is a great school, I learned bottom up. You know, I learned how to analyze, you know, whether a gear could take a certain stress or if a bearing could take a certain load, but we didn't get um, that much of an outside in, you know, let's look at the system. How do you design? How do you think about it? Now, this is, doesn't apply just to design. It also applies to things like, um, um, calculus, you know, Luke used the example of calculus. Of course you want to learn calculus, but really what it is about calculus in the long term is, um, I call it calculus thinking. And you don't, it doesn't apply just to math. This calculus thinking of slopes and derivatives and integrating actually applies to a lot of things in life. If you really get it, you got to speak that language. And so uh, that is what is referred to as uh, constructionism or constructivism. And it has its his, uh, historical origins in the work of people like, uh, Piaget, the other hero in this field is Papert at MIT. And how do you trade that off? The strange thing is it's the outside in thing that gives the inside out thing life. And that's what was missing in, in my own education. I learned a lot of things inside out. I learned from the bottom up, but I never got the big picture. And for me, it all clicked, as I said, when I uh, went to Schlumberger and um, they would train us in this boot camp mode where in the middle of the night, they'd wake us up and say, the separator is broken, go fix it and the separator would be going crazy, the pressure would be building up. And of course, what had happened was in the middle of the night, someone had gone intentionally in a thoughtful way, sabotaged uh, the separator. And I was applying control principles, control theory principles, which I sort of didn't really understand when I was a kid, but now I did, but in an applied way to say, oh, it's out of control. You know, the bellows is leaking or whatever. And then I would fix it. And that was what was amazing. But the other thing I realized in Schlumberger was they weren't trying to get rid of me. They were trying to make me a success. And one of the other challenges in our education system is, it, and it goes back to this Thondikean view, it maybe goes back to Galton and you know, the whole IQ thing was to separate the winners from the losers, the people who have it from the people who don't. But at Schlumberger, it was all about, you're gonna be on the rig, you're gonna make us money, we wanna make you successful. And that transformation was um, incredible. It wasn't about winnowing. So the question then was, can we take this, the Schlumberger approach and sort of take it out, you know, jailbreak it from the world of Schlumberger and scale it. So when I arrived at MIT um, many years later, um, this is what Woody Flowers was doing with 2007, which is creative thinking, applying, and MIT was also doing the inside out and the twain were in fact meeting. Um, so, what does open learning do? I'll end with this. So the MIT, uh, our office, open learning, uh, Molly, who introduced us, is a, um, and a wonderful member of open learning. This is the office that hosts, hosts a lot of our work in open course, right? MITx, MicroMasters. Open learning tries to strike the balance between, on the one hand, making knowledge accessible. And that we have done by giving our entire curriculum away for free through open courseware. And open courseware now has um, more than 150 million unique um, visitors, uh, several hundred million uh, users. And then we created MITx a few years ago, but actually uh, eight years ago. And then we spun it out into edX, um, which is a Harvard MIT investment. And edX has crossed 100 million enrollments. The difference between open courseware and edX is, and MITx courses on edX is that those courses have a cadence and at the end of it, you get a certificate. Open courseware is simply the sort of the class notes and videos uh, of, the, of the class. Um, so we made knowledge accessible, but you know, MIT still admits students and admitting, and we admit 6%, so it's still a winnowing process. So is there something in between? Can we blur those boundaries? 
And that's how we invented the MicroMasters. What we did was we said, we will take four courses in a field, let's say supply chain, that was in fact our first one, and we will offer them on a freemium basis. All MOOCs are freemium, so the content is you can access it for free, but you pay for certificates and assessments and so on. Um, and you pay a very nominal amount. So can we make these MOOCs um, uh, and turn and take these four courses? And we invented this thing called a MicroMasters, basically half a master's, but there is no admissions. We call it inverted admissions. Anyone can take the courses and you just take them. And when you finish, if you finish, and there's no admissions, if you finish, you get a MicroMasters. But if you finish and you do really well, and you apply to MIT with the MicroMasters, then we will give you credit for the stuff you've already finished. And we will let you um, graduate. If it's a one-year master's, you get credit for half the semester, half one semester, you finish in half the time. So that way we were balancing access with selection and you know some element of you, you know, you're gonna make it at MIT. And this is an example of how we believe we will need to fundamentally rethink the way in which we um, um, balance this, this epic struggle in, in society, which is on the one hand, you know, some people are going to get the job, some won't. So there is an element of winnowing with the issue of how we um, give access to the world. So that's how we sort of trade it off. And in everything we do at MITx and edX, we try to apply some of the principles of cognitive science that we talk about in the book, such as you know the uh, short videos, the testing effect, the spacing effect, interleaving, all that stuff. We try and apply it. It's not easy, and we're going to get better at it. So that's the story of the book. That's the arc. I again wanted to say thank you to Luke. Luke has been such an incredible partner because to craft these four arcs and to make them fit together was quite a feat. I think uh, Luke did a really good job. So all the credit to him, really but really a pleasure to talk to you about it. And um, I would, um, we welcome questions and back to you, Molly. Thank you so much, Sanjay, and thank you, Luke. So I'm gonna start with one um, that is about um, in-person education versus online. And the question is, what is best taught in person and what is best taught online? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Molly, I think we unfortunately have it completely backwards now. We do today, the things that are better done online, we do them in person. So lectures, honestly, most lectures are better done online. Why? You know, today lectures are a free train. First of all, they're 45 minutes or 90 minutes or whatever it is. And really, the cognitive science tells us that, you know, the prefrontal cortex, this guy, the CEO of the brain gets tired after about 10 minutes and we just plow on. And after that, you get what is called the illusion of learning. Students think they're learning, they're not they're actually getting familiar, which is almost worse than learning because it gives you a false confidence. And we're very good as professors at shaking a finger at the students have uh, in, in their face and saying, you're not paying attention, making them feel guilty. The really lecture should be 10 minutes. We can do that online, you can't do that in person. And then all the other tricks, you know, that we should be doing like the spacing effect, retrieval effect, the ability of a student to pause or fast forward or rewind, all those things you can do in a real lecture, but you can do all those things online. But the few things, we can only do in person, we neglect to do. And that is a terrible uh, tragedy, right? So for example, coaching, uh, hands-on experiments, discussions. You can do discussions on Zoom, but it's much better if you're actually at a museum, you know, looking at a Van, a Van Gogh painting to discuss Van Gogh and to compare Van Gogh with the other post-impressionists. We really never took advantage of in person. What we have going on today with the Zoom University is the, is the worst of both worlds. We've taken, it's not good online, and we've taken the one thing we should have, uh, because good online is asynchronous videos, right? Like Khan Academy or MITx. We haven't done that. They're just doing you know, extemporized sort of Zoom lectures. And, um, and it's not good in person either because the little, the few things we did well in in person, we're not doing that either. So when we get back to doing things in person, I hope we will really value it and spend it doing the things we ought to be doing in person, coaching, experiments, labs, uh, discussions, the informal stuff, the serendipitous stuff, the electric vehicle team, the social service, um, and those can only be done really mostly in person. Thanks, Sanjay. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, it's kind of exciting the the co-author to the 
on online education policy initiative that you mentioned earlier, Karen Wilcox, Professor Karen Wilcox, who now lives and works across the globe is with us. And hopefully maybe uh, she'll be able to join us and say a few words about her work with you. But in the meantime, um, another thing, Karen is here. Um, I, Karen, if you wanna unmute and join us, we'd love to hear from you. It's great to have you with us. I'm not sure. Um, Oh, hey, all right. Hey, Karen. Well, now, now you've caught me out because I'm out running next to the river in Austin while listening to Sunday and Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Karen. Excellent. That's Karen for you, but. So, so getting back to some of the questions that um, people had, several folks wanted you to talk a little bit more, either Luke or Sanjay, about the concept of um, inside out learning versus outside in. Um, what that means, just a little bit more clarification of that. I can, I can talk a little about that. It's, it's, not, it's not a question of the inside out learning versus outside in learning. It's um, inside out approach to, to understanding the world versus out, an outside in approach to understanding the world. So um, uh, inside out, it, it, its closest cousin is reduc reductionism, which is you would, you know, you try to understand uh, biology in terms of chemistry. You try to understand, um, explain chemistry in terms of physics so for, you know in the so for instance the, no, the Nobel Prize today it was a bio, biological um, uh, phenomenon that, uh, that is CRISPR but they won the prize in chemistry because it was ultimately you know came down to severing and reattaching chemical bonds right um, and um, reductionism is all about getting to the very bottom but what we're talking about is a little bit more of like getting to the getting to the mechanisms, which may be at different levels. So you're not trying to get all the way to the bottom, but get to these explanatory levels. And so rather than say throughout the book, this sort of like reductionism, but not quite reductionism, we coined this term inside out approach, a mechanistic approach for, for understanding the world from the inside out. And outside in approaches, you say, well, you know what? There might be all these factors that we can't, ima we can't uh, incorporate into this mechanistic model. So let's, um, it's, it's, is closest to analog is, is holism, where you try to incorporate, uh, where you try to have a, an experimental study subject or an observational subject that is really very large and you don't try to break it up into little pieces. I, I, hope, I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you another analogy, uh, another um, sort of, um, not an analogy, perhaps another view of exactly what Luke just said. So um, the way uh, Luke's ex, uh, uh, cartoon was actually spot on. Every physicist wants to be a mathematician. Every engineer wants to be a physicist. And so, you know, the thing though is that let's take math. We teach math the way we prove it. But actually, when we when it was discovered, it was discovered outside in. Someone saw a mathematical phenomenon, they generalized it, a physical physics phenomenon, they generalized it, and then they discovered the truth. But we teach it inside out. We teach, we start with the theorem and the lemma, and then we somehow assume the student's going to get the the intuition and insight. And that is terrible. I mean, we don't teach it the way, you know, Poincaré learned, you know, discovered uh, topology. We to give everyone the theory, he came up 10 years into his development, and then we teach the insight. We should teach it the other way. And in fact, there's a lot of uh, research now on the Hungarian schools of mathematics. The Hungarians are really good at mathematics. And they actually have a very holistic view in the way they look at mathematics. It's much more insightful. It's outside in, in and they get to the inside out piece. But they don't do it in reverse. But we rewrite history in some sort of, in my view, misplaced machismo, you know, sort of intellectual machismo, and mm -hmm. present it in a way that is completely unintuitive to students, and not all students, but some students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, several people are asking about higher education as a whole, commenting that it's rather conservative. And how does one get a conservative institution embrace a model such as your pitching? How do we transform and scale and reach students everywhere, given that education is hard to transform and change? Well, it's gonna be difficult. It's gonna be, it's not gonna be easy. Um, the reason is we've trained, um, um, you know, the whole cadre of um, leaders and where you'll be created regulations. The teachers themselves are the poor, they're caught in the middle. Uh, my mother was a teacher and the teachers try hard and they do magic, but really the systems have been set up but you know, it's very interesting when we move into the gig economy and people have to work for themselves and it doesn't matter whether you graduate from MIT or from some, you know, a college in, in, in a distant continent, 
it, it, that signaling only applies for your first gig if you're in a gig economy, if you're a freelancer. Your third gig is going to depend on the reference from your second gig. So they're gonna to have to start valuing more and more true learning over the signaling value of the, you know, the brand you went to. So mm -hmm. this is gonna to have to change very fast. And you know, COVID's gonna be a, a moment of reckoning for a lot of us, for educational institutions. Many will die, unfortunately, because you know, foot traffic and tuition and they're paying rent and so on. And so hopefully um, the, the silver lining is we'll all wake up to this. You know, I would, I would just add that in, in the book, we talk about the different approaches to reform and we kind of, we kind of take a tour through these different things from uh, experimental schools to, to these really cool preschools and things like that. And, you know, there are some people out there trying to convert institutions and there's others, um, th there's this wildflower um, group of, uh, of Montessori preschools that is essentially trying to grow in the sidewalk cracks and, and, ex and spread in this organic way. And so, I would say that if you're curious about how this stuff comes into the world that we're talking about, there, there are some examples in the book. Thank you. Our uh, colleague, Bill Bonvillian, has a really good question. He says, if we can get the principles of learning science built into online courses in a systematic way, could that be transformative of Thorndike dominated in-person classroom education? How and how could that, what would change? I think um, Bill is a wise and thoughtful man, and he, as usual, makes a wise and thoughtful comment. I think that that's exactly right. The, I will say that online asynchronous content almost naturally begs for good cognitive, um, the application of good cognitive principles. It's very hard to shoot the 30 minute video. <laughs> it's much easier to shoot a 10 minute video. Mm -hmm. At the end of the video, you need to do something. And naturally, edX, for example, does um, finger exercises, little formative ex assessments, which is something called the testing effect, which we talk about. Um, the space retrieval, et cetera, takes more planning, but I actually think that it's actually so much easier. And if we did that, we would um, displace time from the classroom or re release time in the classroom. And then the professor in the classroom has got to figure out how to make that fun. And I think you could do some real magic there. So yeah, I mean, I think that online, um, there are a few tricks when you apply them. Um, it's actually surprisingly conducive to this. Mm. Thank you. Um, this is an, a question from Enrique Shada, and it sort of um, echoes the uh, factory model that you folks talked about um, around students as workers and fact, school as factory and so forth. Enrique says, how much of learning infrastructure has been shaped by industrialists and how far did it take us from the natural way that humans learn? In other words, can we change our daily activities activities to increase our tacit learning? Luke, do you want to take a stab at it? Uh, but why don't you talk about the history a little bit, then I'll come back to maybe um, the cognitive science. Sure. I mean, I, I think I would say that, um, you know, it just so happened that educational institutions in, in the U.S., but I think this is this spread pretty far and wide, um, happened to coincide with this um, vogue for Taylorism, where I think we say in the book, there were bespectacled men with stopwatches just hiding around every corner and every office and, and government building you could think of. Um, and, and they were, they were um, dedicated to, to rooting out inefficiency. And um, uh, you know, I think one of the things we say is that in, in, that, in that quest and in, in kind of related quest for standardization, right, some, some, some stuff did get lost. Um, and I think you know, Dewey in particular, but also, you know, Maria Montessori and s some other kind of outside in thinking heroes um, did, did notice some of the stuff that was getting lost in, in that, in that, tra in that transition. Um, and, uh, and some, you know, Montessori ultimately stepped outside of the, uh, of the, uh, of the system and, and set up her own, her own uh, educational system. Um, but yeah, so I think, the fact that this that this institution was coalescing right at this moment in in uh, in, in uh, industrial history was was pretty important. Um, as far as the factory model is concerned, you know, uh, that's uh, that's uh, a, a lot of different people have used that to a lot that um, metaphor to a lot of different ends, and it's ultimately one we kind of rejected in a little bit in in favor of what we call the winnower model, which is you know, a factory stamps all the raw materials into into a 
a consistent final form that a winnower achieves consistency by casting raw materials aside. And I think that's that's part of the issue that we're raising with the with the current system. Maybe I'll just say that um, that um, in you know if let's say that a company educates a person, a young person, the company is educating them for that job, not for life. And a, the the sacred mission of an educational institution is to educate someone for life, right? So if the student learns music, it may not help them with the company, but it prepares them for life. With, you know, musical, you know, appreciation of music. Um, and also, you know, perhaps some of those principles that apply in the next job or in some meta level. So, um, in fact, corporate education is a little bit more mechanistic, as Luke described. And there is, in fact, some aspect of that that's baked into the Thondikian philosophy. And then you add in all the sort of the class system that he baked in, you know, basically preparing people a little bit to be like automatons. Uh, Luke referred to the Taylorism that's inherent in that. Taylorism is, ba is named after, I think his name was Friedrich Taylor, the, the engineer at, uh, if I recall, Ford, who developed these principles of, um, you know, turning, making people very efficient with time and motion studies. And that's captured in the Charlie Chaplin movie, right, Modern Times. So, um, yeah, so that impact is there. And that's what comes down to Ellen Lagerman's quote, that Thondike won and Dewey lost. It is mm -hmm. mechanistic, it is a little bit corporate, and it prepares you for the next job. And we have an element of that. Mm. Higher ed in America, especially Amer American higher, higher ed has fought that, thank God. But I think needs to do a lot more. Mm. We have a question from one of your former students, Kat Donnelly, uh, who she's grateful for her inter interdisciplinary engineering systems, PhD from MIT that you helped her engineer, uh, which brought many departments together. She's asking, how can MIT promote more big picture interdisciplinary graduates, maybe with student designed curriculums, how can we drill out to the big problems versus drilling into the minutes? First of all, hi, Kat. Lovely to hear from you. Um, um, I think that um, we need more people like Kat. She came from a very interdisciplinary background. Her thesis was interdisciplinary. In fact, graduate school is very, can be very interdisciplinary because graduate students craft a thesis and then they craft a curriculum almost in pursuit of that. And because there's some required courses, but there's a lot of freedom. And uh, working with Kat, I began to work on behavioral psychology. I mean, she sort of, you know, through her research is how I learned about that topic. Um, I believe, I think that in the undergraduate realm, we need to do a little bit more of that. I think we need to take some principles of apprenticeship and coaching that we do in grad school and move it more to undergrad. Undergrad has become a little bit more sort of um, a treadmill, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of really interesting questions and we're not going to get to all of them, but this one really jumped out at me and I, I thought it might be worth um, asking. Brian Hugh says, and this is a slightly political question, but if our educational system is focused on culling the herd, that would explain the dis disillusionment of the lower half of the IQ bell curve in our population. Rather than figured out how they can best succeed, we've pigeonholed them into dead end professions. So the question is, how can we retool our educational systems to serve everyone, not just, quote, MIT worthy? You know, uh, Brian is actually an MIT graduate. I know him well. He's a dear friend and also um, one of the people behind Explo, which is a summer program. Um, and um, I think we just need to fundamentally rethink our mission as that of transforming every student into a superstar we have lazily slid into the world of declaring winners and losers and damn it, we can, we can be better than that. Hmm. Um, Rita Sahu has a question for us. One of the reasons I enjoyed 2.007 and 2.70 as a student at MIT was how the human aspects were nurtured, collaboration and teamwork, et cetera. And the students were allowed to lead and the instructors took a step back. Some of us experienced that for the first time at MIT and the quote humility aspect was and is one of the reasons that the course was and is extremely successful and made us learn in a fun way. I guess that's a, she's just reflecting on that. I think she's uh, uh, inspired by what you've said around this related information. Yeah, no, I agree with Rita. Um, I, think, um, I think that uh, we just need to stand back a little bit, you know, with students sort of guided, uh, deliberate practice is the term that a very eminent um, 
uh, a scient uh, psychologist, Anders Ericsson, uh, describes it in a book he wrote called uh, uh, Peak, the, the Science of Expertise, I think it's called. He passed away a few months ago. It's a real tragedy. But uh, the whole science of coaching, I think we need to internalize it in education. Mm -hmm. So we've run out of time, but I just want to thank you both for this fantastic X talk. It was our first virtual one, and it's been a great success. Thank you so much. I guess if we can just virtually clap for you. Thank you so no, much, I, Luke. Um, and my, and my thanks to, to Sanjay and to the, to the whole team here. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody.